Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, first of all, we'd like to thank you for registering at Future Pathways. I'm Rima from the Future Pathways team and helping me organize today's lecture is Mohamed al -Humoud. Uh Today's lecture will be given by Dr. Ali. Please feel free to send your questions on the Q&A box throughout the lecture and we'll collect the most relevant questions and ask them to the doctor uh, during the Q&A session at the end. Dr. Ali, whenever you're ready, we begin. Okay, thank you, Rima. Uh, so good morning, everyone. My name is Dr. Basi. I'm one of the teaching physicians at King Saud University. Uh, a little bit about myself. Uh, I've graduated from King Abdul Aziz University in 2008. I uh, did my internship over there uh, in 2009, then started uh, at King Saud University. Uh, then I went to the States for a master's degree for two years, then a year of uh, 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 research with uh, Dr. Togus Tulandi at McGill University in Canada. Then I did my residency at McGill University. Okay. So I have nothing to disclose. We're gonna go over uh, what is Obigaini. I know you guys just had a lecture with uh, Dr. Dana, but anyhow, I'm gonna go briefly uh, about that. Why Canada, the residency program over there in Canada and how to get there. So what is Obigaini? Okay. It's a medical specialty that has two fields. The obstetrical part, which means dealing with pregnant patients, um, even before they got pregnant, preconceptional visits are super important for us as an obstetrician, okay? We see them, we make sure that they don't have any uh, um, high-risk diseases, we adjust their medications, make sure that they're doing okay, and they're ready to get pregnant. And then during pregnancy, we often see them roughly every month or so, okay, to make sure that they're doing fine, measure their blood pressures, uh, blood sugars, just to, to, to make sure that the pregnancy is going uh, as expected, okay? And then when they come into labor, um, we follow them, them up, deliver them either by vaginal delivery, using uh, either forceps or uh, ventus, depends on the situation, uh, or we do cesarean section, okay? And then after that, we follow them up for about six weeks during the postpartum period, making sure that they're going back to their uh, pre-pregnancy uh, 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 condition, okay? The other part is the gynae part, where we cover everything else related to a uh, uh, woman's health. Um, if she's having a problem with her period, uh, fibroids, endometriosis, um, abnormal bleeding, uh, vaginal discharge, uh, and usually um, we can either do nothing, we just observe them, or we can go and give them medical treatment, mainly hormonal treatment, or if needed, we might need to do surgeries for them. If she has a fibroid or something, then we have to take that fibroid out. So as you can see, it's kind of like a medical and surgical specialty, okay? You can just observe or give medical treatment, or you can actually go ahead and treat the patient surgically, okay? So after you've done your residency, you can either be a generalist and start practicing general obigyne, or you can sub-specialize in one of these uh, specialty. Uh, gynecology, oncology, you're dealing mainly with oncological cases, cancer to the ovaries, uterus, tubes, okay? Uh, it's mainly a surgical specialty. You're gonna be in the OR most of the day, most of the week, okay? Um, and you're gonna deal with complications related to the uh, surgery. The other surgical specialty is your gynecology, where you actually have to deal with per, uh, pelvic floor prolapse, uh, incontinence. You might give them some medications or exercises, but again, you might be in the OR at least once or twice a week, okay? Then maternal fetal medicine is when a patient has high risk conditions, okay? So let's say she has um, uh, epilepsy or SLE or something that needs to be followed by someone who specializes in this. So usually we refer those patients to MFM, maternal fetal medicine. It has two parts, the maternal part and the fetal part. So if there's a maternal disease, it goes to maternal fetal medicine. But if there is also a fetal condition, let's say congenital heart disease, baby has um, uh, Down syndrome, twins, 
then usually we refer them to maternal fetal medicine. It's mainly medical more than anything else. However, they do some surgical procedures, uh, small sur surgical procedures, uh, like uh, fetal surgery where they actually transfuse blood to the baby or uh, uh, amniocentesis when they take the amniotic fluid uh, for uh, culture or whatever, or curry typing, okay? So they do have some uh, small surgical procedures, but it's mainly medical, okay? And the last one is REI. Uh, it's mainly about uh, dealing with uh, infertile couples, okay? Trying to give them medication so they can get pregnant. So it's more medical. Again, they might do some surgical uh, procedures, uh, procedures like um, uh, opening the fallopian tube if it's obstructed, removing the whole tube, uh, also removing the fibroids, um, or if she has endometriosis, they might do that as well. Um, each one of these, uh, you're gonna have to study for at least two years, okay? And you're gonna have to write an exam by the end of your training, except for uh, uh, your gynae, okay? But the rest you have to, to write an exam. If you're not interested in these major specialties, then you can actually do a, a small one, like uh, studying uh, ultrasound or fetal echo, minimum invasive surgery like uh, laparoscopy, hysteroscopy or robotic, uh, sexual health, uh, menopause or adolescent. It's only for a year, okay? And you don't have to write an exam. You're gonna be a generalist, but at least a generalist who knows how to use the scope or who knows how to deal with someone who's, let's say 15. Okay, so it, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's an option as well. So what are the pros and cons of being an obstetrician? First of all, as I showed you, you have different specialty. You can be an oncologist or maternal medicine or just a generalist, so you can't choose, okay? You bring joy to families if you're delivering a baby, healthy baby, for couples who couldn't get pregnant for years or, or uh, help someone with a prolapse, okay? You can work in the office or in the OR. So if you decided to take care of uh, menopause, you can just be in the office, okay? If you decided to um, do only MFM, you just, you can stay in the office. You don't have to be uh, in the OR. However, if you decided to do gynecologist or even a general gynecologist, you might need to be in the OR most of the time. It's your decision. You can actually do both if you want, okay? It's different, literally. Every day is totally different than the, the previous day, okay? Uh, which is, uh, I think, uh, is, is not a boring specialty for me. In general, the income is good, okay, especially for the OB part. And the uh, uh, if you are specialized in uh, REI, in, in fertility, then the outcome is actually even better. But for instance, if you're doing gynecology oncology, then the, the income is is fine, okay? But you shouldn't actually focus on that much. The other thing is, let's say in obstetrics, you're seeing a patient roughly every month, right? So, and then you're gonna see her for about six weeks after. And if she gets pregnant again, then you're gonna have to see her again. And so on and so forth. Uh, for general gynae, you might see, you might need to see uh, a patient every year to assess her general condition. So you're gonna build up a, a relationship with your patients. Do I have a question here? What is the monthly allowance? I'm gonna go over this. Sure, I'm gonna go over this. Okay, the cons, of course, a lot of stress. You have to be in the hospital most of the day, okay? We do take calls, roughly uh, six to seven calls. In Canada, your max is four calls a month, okay? And maximum 12 hours, you can't do more than 12 hours. You're not allowed to do more than 12 hours a call. However, you're only on calls during the weekends. So you're working, you are working during the weekdays, but you're on call during the weekends. And who's covering the, the night shifts during the weekends uh, are the night floaters, okay? For a whole month, you're covering the floor during the night for about another 12 hours, okay? You're in the labor room, you're running most of the time. It's, it's crazy, okay? So during your residency, it is so crazy. You might need to deliver some unfortunate news if the baby did not survive or the couples couldn't get pregnant and they won't, won't be able to get pregnant or someone has cancer, then you might need to do 
deliver that news, okay? And of course, since you're dealing with healthy people, the OB people, OB patients, then, then the malpractice is actually super high. So you gotta have to find uh, good insurance, okay? And lastly, some patients, they do prefer uh, um, uh, female over male, okay? They prefer to have a female physician over a male physician. However, for me, it wasn't a problem. Even when I was in Canada, it was not a problem, okay? I was able actually to explain to the patient why uh, I need to examine her. And most of them, they do agree. And, and even here in Saudi Arabia, I've been here, I've been working here for about a year now and I, I don't have a problem. I didn't have a problem yet. So why Canada? They do have well-structured programs, okay? And why is that? Because they have to follow the uh, regulations of the Royal College of Canada, okay? They have to meet the minimum standard, okay? If they don't, they might be uh, uh, put under probation, okay? And if they're still not doing a good job, uh, they might lose the privilege of having residents and fellows, okay? So that's why they have to follow certain regulations, certain standards, and it's strict, it's not that easy. Usually the Royal College, they visit each program roughly every two to three years to make sure that they're actually following those regulations. Uh, and then they put them under either uh, passed or uh, they need uh, another review or uh, intention to withdraw. So they're working really hard to make uh, the Canadian programs uh, um, like well structured, okay? We've been, we've been working with them for about four years. So we know them really well and they know us, okay? And the good thing about us, we do have our own positions over there. So the Saudi uh, um, Minister of Education um, has an agreement with many universities over there to preserve certain positions for certain specialty, okay? So you're not competing actually with the Canadians. You're competing with the candidates from the Middle East. Okay, which is a little bit easier. I feel, I mean, it's it's clear, um, and everything is covered. The tuition fee, fees are covered. Okay, and the thank goes to the Minister of Education. So usually, this is actually the uh, the latest uh, uh, table uh, on the website. Uh, the income is about uh, sixty five hundred reals a month. Okay which is about $2,500 uh, a month. This is if you are alone. Um, you have uh, about $2,200 uh, uh, a month extra if you have a wife and 300 for each child, okay? Uh, over there, you're not allowed to work for free. So the universities, they have to pay you money. So the agreement between the uh, Saudi Bureau and the university is that the Saudi Bureau will uh, pay the universities $18,000 a year, okay? In return, they're gonna give you $1,500 a month, which is the minimum wage. So in, in other words, you're getting 250, 2,500, sorry, plus the 1,500. So the total is about 4,000 a month, okay? And uh, the, the, the Canadian is about 2.76. You can't, Abdurrahim, you can't actually, you have to go, you can't pay your own uh, fees. It has to go through the uh, uh, Saudi Bureau. Uh, usually the Saudi Bureau, that they pay about, uh, I think $100,000 uh, a year if I'm not mistaken. But most universities, they don't actually accept uh, personal funding. Okay, so briefly, um, this is the map of Canada. They have 10 uh, provinces, uh, British Columbia, Al uh, Alberta, Saskatchewan, Manitoba, Ontario, Quebec, New Brunswick, Nova Scotia, Prince Edward, and Newfoundland, okay? Over here is the Pacific Ocean, 
over here is the Atlantic Ocean. Okay, the states over here. Okay, the Saudi Arabia they do have an agreement with about twelve universities. Okay, however, in the Obigaini, uh, we have only six. Okay, in Manitoba, in the state of Winnipeg, it's uh, University of Manitoba, Ontario in Toronto, University of Toronto, and in Hamilton, University of McMaster, Quebec, in the city of Montreal, um, we have um, McGill University and University of Montreal, uh, Nova Scotia, and the city of Halifax, uh, University of Dalhousie. Okay, so one, two, three, four, five, six. Okay, they all speak English, except in Quebec, 70% they do speak French. Okay, but um, it's not a huge problem. I'm going to talk about that uh, in a moment. Okay, so about only six out of 12 programs, or six out of 12 universities do accept uh, 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 candidates from the Middle East to join their OBGYN programs. Okay, so how many do um, they usually, uh, let's see here. So Quebec, as I said, uh, city of Montreal, McGill University or University of Montreal, okay? This is the province where they speak mainly French, right? So is it a problem? I was graduated from McGill University. It was a bit of a problem at the beginning, okay? However, I try to learn a little bit of French, but you don't have to have it because everything is in English. It's an English university, okay? If you're dealing with a patient who speaks French, you can ask her politely to speak English. If she doesn't know how to speak English, then you might ask a nurse or a student to translate that for you. It wasn't a problem, okay? However, on the other hand, University of Montreal, it's a French university. So you have to speak French. You have to actually do an exam. Uh, I don't know the name of the exam, but you have to do an exam in French to assess your language and you have to get a B2, minimum B2, for you to be able to apply. Okay, then uh, Nova Scotia, state of Halifax, uh, Dalhousie University. Okay, over here you have to write your IELTS exam and you have to get at least seven out of nine before you apply. It's a must. Okay, uh, uh, province of Manitoba, state of Winnipeg, the University of uh, Manitoba, then uh, Ontario in Hamilton, uh, McMaster University, and uh, in Toronto, um, University of Toronto. Uh, also the IELTS for University of Manitoba, you have to get a seven out of nine for you to be able to apply, okay? The rest, you don't have to write any English uh, uh, exam. So usually at McGill, they take about two a year. University of Montreal, one, Dalhousie, one, Manitoba, one, McMaster, one, University of Toronto one. However, it's not a must. For McGill, they always take two. But UDM, Dalhousie University of Manitoba, McMaster University of Toronto, it's every other year or every three years, okay? So minimum is two and maximum is seven. And it's, I'm not saying two from Saudi Arabia, I'm saying two from the Middle East, okay? For Dalhousie, what they do usually after you apply, they pick about two to three candidates and they ask them to come for, an, for a month to do an elective. And after that, they decide if they do like that candidate or not. If they do, then, then they're going to take him or her. Otherwise, they're not going to accept anyone. So as you can see, let's say seven applicants or seven candidates, okay? And usually 70 um, the, uh, about 70 applicants uh, apply every year, roughly, okay, give or take. So about 10% of those will, will get accepted, okay? It's a little bit tough, but it's not impossible, okay? That's why you're gonna have to try over and over again, okay? And you have to improve your uh, CV. And actually most of them, uh, most of the universities are actually uh, the top 10, University of Toronto, McGill, uh, UDM, McMaster, and even Dalhousie and Manitoba, I think they're like 12 and 15. So um, they're one of the uh, uh, great, 
good universities. And these two are actually uh, in the top uh, 50. So the program in Canada, it's a five year program, right? R1, you usually do uh, rotations in Otigaini where you have to deal with low risk patients, uh, postpartum patients, normal deliveries, um, general gynae issues like vaginal bleeding, um, someone who needs uh, uh, counseling about uh, contraception, okay? However, you have to do a month of internal medicine, a month of general surgery, a month of ICU, a month of in ICU, and a month of ER, okay? It's like your internship again, okay? It is actually super useful. Useful. They're not expecting much from you when you do these rotations, okay? But you have to do your, your, your job, okay? You can't come late. You have to be always there. You have to know your patients, but they don't care about your knowledge, okay? Again, in Canada, usually you start at 7 a.m. until 5 p.m., okay? Monday till Friday. It's a busy day, okay? You're gonna be running all the day. Um, especially if you're covering the labor room, okay? And then your calls, as I said, 12 hours, not more than that, okay? About four calls uh, a month. This is actually from McGill, okay? Maybe it's a little bit different uh, in the other universities, but it's not gonna be that different, okay? During the second year, you're dealing mainly with pregnant patients and gynecological patients. So six months in OB and six months in gyne. Okay, over here, you're gonna be more involved in the OR. You have to do the low risk surgeries like open hysterectomy, um, cesareans, uh, salpingectomies, all uh, these low uh, uh, risk surgeries, you're supposed to do it. Okay, once you're on R3, you're gonna be focusing on the subspecialties, the gyne onc, the urogyne, uh, um, MFM and REI. So you're gonna do three months each, okay? Uh, R4, you're gonna go back to urogyne again, and you're allowed to do your elective. So you decided to go uh, somewhere else uh, to do your, let's say, gyne oncology or, or um, REI, then you, you can't do that as an R4. And the last year is the year you're where you are the chief and you have to focus on your exam, okay? Over there, it's different than in Saudi Arabia. Over there, you have only one exam after your fifth year over here. Um, an MCQ, day one MCQ, for, I think um, about 150s MCQ for day one, 150s for day two, and then uh, uh, OSCE for day three, so three days. Okay, you don't have to have exams to, to be promoted from R1 to R2 and, and so on. I think here in Saudi Arabia, they have promotion exams between R1 and R2, uh, part one between R2 and R3, promotions here, promotions here, and then the final, the second part of the board exam. Okay, so usually you are a junior when you're an R1 or R2 and senior for the remaining years. So how can you get there? First of all, you have to do your MCCQE exam. No question about it. Then work on your recommendations and publications. After that, build up your CV and personal statement. Then apply to the Saudi Bureau, then go for your interviews. Okay, so I'm gonna talk about each one separately. For the MCCQE, I'm sure you guys had uh, Okay, I'm sure you guys had a lecture about that. So the MCCQE is the uh, Medical uh, Council of Canada qualification exam. We used to do the MCCEE, uh, but starting I think 2018 or 19, uh, uh, you have to do the MCCQE, okay? It's a one day uh, computer-based uh, exam, okay? You're gonna stay there for about I think four or five hours uh, no, actually more, eight hours, sorry. Uh, four hours in the morning and four hours in the afternoon, roughly. Um, the first four hours is mainly MCQs. The uh, uh, other four hours is about um, uh, um, 
like short answer, okay? Um, it's mainly about internal medicine, general surgery, ob feeds, psych, and epidemiology. Really, you just have to pass. In ob you don't have to have a score per se. However, if you do have, if you can get a higher score or a high score, then that's good, okay? Um, but mainly in the specialty of ob they don't focus much on that score, okay? They look at other stuff. However, it doesn't mean that just pass and get the minimum score. No, try to get a higher score. But if you got a low score, don't give up. Don't say, okay, I don't have a chance. You always have a chance, okay? It's not like in internal medicine, I think. You have to have a minimum of, I think, 350 or something like that for you to be able to apply, okay? You know, Begani, if you, even if you got the minimum score, you still can apply, okay? Do you have a chance? Yes. Is your chance high? Not that much. I can't tell. Depends on the other applicants, okay? Because the, the committee, uh, they're going to look into many, many things, okay? Your publications, your CV, your clinical experience, and your MCCQE score, okay? Um, if you're good in the other parts and you got the minimum passing score in the MCCQE, they're not going to say, no, no, we're not going to take that guy, okay? So focus on uh, um, getting a really high score, but if you just pass, then it's fine. Apply. Don't give up. Study it from Toronto Notes. More than enough. Or you can study from your own uh, materials. But uh, um, if you want to read a different book, Toronto Notes is actually great in that. Uh, you have to do MCQs, no question about it, okay? So Canada Q Bank is actually a good website for, uh, for that. Then recommendations. It, it is better to have a recommendation from someone who uh, is a Canadian graduate, okay? Let's say I'm the program director and I have two candidates. The first one has a recommendation from a guy who uh, uh, did his re residency in Canada, and the other one has a recommendation from someone who did his residency somewhere else. I'm gonna take that one because I know that uh, uh, this guy uh, uh, knows exactly what are the minimum requirements here in Canada, okay? Of course, has to be from an obstetrician, OBGYN, okay? Don't give me a recommendation from someone in internal medicine or general surgery, it has to be from uh, uh, OBGYN, okay? It is better if you get a recommendation from someone who uh, is graduated from the same university. I'm graduated from uh, McGill University. If you are applying to McGill, it is better to get a recommendation from me, okay? If you want to apply to uh, Dalhousie, for instance, it is better to get a recommendation from someone who is graduated from there. It's not a must, it's better, okay? Of course, if you're able to convince me to pick up the phone and call the program director, then your chances are gonna go all the way up to low. okay? It's not that easy to do that, but if you've done it, then you've done a great job, okay? Uh, at least get three letters, or actually three letters. Don't get two, don't get four, only three. They're, gonna not, they're not gonna read four recommendations. So, in terms of the publications, the more the better, okay? There is no minimum number. I can't tell you, well, you have to have only at least two. No, you have to have at least one. But if you have 10, it's better than one, okay? Has to be in, in Obigaini. Well, not has to be, but it's better if it's in Obigaini, okay? Um, uh, I don't like, well, I, I was in the, uh, um, interviewing committee at Kingswood University two months ago. And when someone has many publications, I only look at the Obigaini ones, okay? So try to have more Obigaini publications than uh, other specialty. It doesn't mean that when you have a publication in internal medicine, you're not gonna have a chance over there, but it is better to have more Obigaini publications than uh, uh, the other specialties, okay? needs to be published. Don't try it down uh, working on it or ongoing study, okay? Or at least 
you've submitted the study, okay? Uh, it means you've done something, but don't write ongoing research. So on your CV, make sure it's simple. Make sure it's simple and repeating that over and over again. Do not have a very complicated uh, CV like with tables and graphs and, and pies and, and, and it's all over the place. Just make it simple. They're reading more than 50 CVs, like 60 or 70. They don't have time to go over your CV trying to understand what's in there. Make it simple and, and easy to read, okay? Not more than three pages. Two to three is your uh, goal, okay? One is too short, more than three is too long. Make sure it's organized, well organized. Write your publications. If you've done any extracurricular activities like volunteer working, then you have to write it down. And uh, if you've done a master's degree, then you have to write it down as well. I'm gonna talk about uh, uh, master's uh, soon. Personal statement, one page long. Okay, not more than that. You might reach one and a half, but for me, I think one is more than enough. Again, the program director is reading, or program directors, they're reading uh, many uh, CVs and personal statements. So they don't have time to, to, to waste reading your two pages or three pages personal statement, okay? Mention why you're beginning. I mentioned also why Canada. So you have to, um, explain to them why you've chose Obigaini and why uh, you think Canada is uh, the perfect choice for you, okay? Uh, if you can uh, bring up a personal experience, let's say for instance, when I was a medical student, uh, I was involved in a delivery and the mom uh, was not able to get pregnant for 10 years and eventually she got pregnant and we delivered a healthy baby and they were super happy and that actually touched me or whatever. So that's actually a personal experience. It's nice to mention that. Don't make it just journal. Make sure that your, uh, I, 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 your grammar and spellings are correct, okay? So after that, you're gonna apply to the Saudi Bureau. You don't have to apply uh, paper, just apply online, which is uh, nice. Usually you apply between March and June. Okay, for the residency beginning the following year. So let's say if you want to start in July, usually they start in July 2021. Okay, then you have to apply March, June 2020. So how, you have to check the website uh, regularly, the, the Saudi Arabia website to make sure that uh, you don't miss the uh, um, applying period. Okay, you have to have your CV ready your personal statement, ready? Three recommendations. Your financial guarantee, you have to have a financial guarantee. You can't just apply like that. So uh, you have to call your sponsoring agency to give you a financial guarantee or you just apply to the uh, Ministry of Education, okay? To, to get your sponsoring uh, your financial guarantee. You have to have your MCC QE ready and uh, either your IELTS, Okay, uh, English exam or your French exam depends on uh, the university. Okay, then certificate, the uh, medical school and internship, your transcript. The Saudi Bureau, they ask for uh, a certificate of ad attendance, uh, at least three. So if you can attend three conferences during your med school in Obigaini, then uh, you can submit uh, these. Okay, it's not a must for the universities, but for some reason, the uh, Saudi Bureau, they ask for that. Okay, and lastly, your Saudi ID and passport. How can you get a sponsor? Well, it's either, okay, it's either you, um, um, like if you're a um, demonstrator in a university, that's it. King uh, uh, King Faisal, such um, as they usually sponsor their uh, uh, residents, uh, or you apply to the Ministry of Education. Okay, there are many ways. Um, let me answer some of the questions. What is the monthly allowance for doctors doing business? Uh, about the MCCC, what score should I aim for? Well, it's not. 
about the MCCQE2 exam, you don't have to do the second part because there is MCCQE part one and MCCQE part two. You don't have to do part two. Part one is enough. Okay. Uh, how uh, IELTS or TOEFL? No IELTS. Okay. Uh, we, they don't uh, accept TOEFL anymore. It's only IELTS. And you have to get seven out of eight total band score and seven in each part. After that, after you apply, the Saudi Bureau will contact uh, uh, the universities, okay? And if they do uh, take Obigaini candidates, they're gonna submit your application to them. They're gonna review your file. And if they decided that you're a good candidate for, for uh, you're a good candidate, then they're gonna call you for an interview. Usually the interview is gonna be between uh, August to roughly uh, December. So let's say this is the year of 2020. We apply between March and June. If they say yes, you're gonna come to the interview roughly between August to December. And if you got lucky and got accepted, you're gonna start your residency in about 21, July 2020, uh, July 2021, okay? Most of the time, you're gonna do your interview and then they will let you know in about a day or so if you got accepted or not, okay? I'm not gonna all go over how, like what to do during your interview and, uh, how, and how to ace it because it is outside the scope of this uh, uh, presentation, but you guys should be ready for that, okay? So how can you increase your chances? What are the things that they look for in your beginning mainly? Number one, elective rotation. I believe personally that you should go there and do a month of elective. Okay, it will increase your chances. If I am the program director and I have someone who worked for, with me for a month and I know this person, that his personality, his, his CV, his knowledge, all that, and someone else who I know nothing about, okay, I'm gonna pick that one, okay? It's not an easy month, okay? Because you have to be great for a whole month. You have to be there um, first thing in the morning, stay till the end of the day. And uh, you have to know your patients. Uh, you have to read, ask questions. So it's not an easy month, but if you aced it, then I can't guarantee you a position over there, okay? On the other hand, if you didn't do a good job, then it's, 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 it's over for you in that university, okay? Uh, then recommendations. You have to have an FRCSC. Uh, a recommendation from someone who is FRCSC from Obigaini, okay? And same university. Try your best to, to do that. It does not mean if you have a recommendation from someone who is graduated from another university or from the Saudi program or from Europe, you don't have a chance. But I'm saying uh, these are the things that will increase your chances, okay? Have some applications, okay? If you don't have any applications, then most likely they're not gonna take you. But having only one application is enough. The more, the better, okay? If you do have clinical experience in the field of Ibigaini, then your chances are better. Let's say if you're a resident, an R3 or an R4 resident, when they talk to you, they're gonna tell, well, this guy, he knows his stuff, okay? And, and, uh, and uh, he's gonna be uh, an amazing resident when he starts with us. Okay, I'm gonna answer these two questions in a second. Um, you have to do great in your um, interview, okay? I know some candidates who are great on paper, but during the interview, they, they didn't do well at all, okay? And they got rejected. So you have to do super well in the interview, okay? You have to be fluent in English, of course. And if you are applying uh, to University of Montreal, uh, or even McGill University, if you speak French, then that's great. Master's degree, it's not a must, but it's a good thing to have it. I do have a master's degree, okay? 
Um, I'm not quite sure if it helped me with my acceptance, but I, I think it helped, okay? It's not gonna help you during your residency, but it might help you uh, on your paper, okay? So if you do have time and you did not get lucky this year, then apply for a master's degree, okay? And uh, I, 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 believe, I believe it's, it's a good way to increase your chances. Lastly, your GPA and MCC QE score, okay? The higher, the better, of course. Okay, I'm gonna answer all this in a second. So once you apply, don't give up, okay? You might get lucky and get accepted from the first time, but you might fail and, and then you should try again and again and again okay don't give up i applied twice i did not i did not get accepted the first time i got accepted the second time okay one of my friends he got accept, accept, accepted from the first time some of my colleagues after the third time and actually two of my close friends got accepted after the fourth time they were residents here in saudi arabia okay they were our fives when they started their residency over there in canada okay so don't give up. Meanwhile, you can actually do three things while waiting. The first one is staying here in Saudi Arabia and just work, okay? Getting more clinical experience. The second option is to join the Saudi program while applying, okay? So you're not wasting time. The third option is to go there to Canada, okay? To do a master's degree, to be um, a research assistant, uh, um, so to be kind of like uh, close to them, okay? Believe me, if you don't give up and you try over and over again, eventually you're gonna get it, okay? It's not that easy, it's a competitive field. However, it's not impossible, okay? Thank you guys. You can uh, follow me on Twitter. Uh, special, special thank to Future Pathways for organizing this. Uh, this is actually a nice website. They do have a Twitter account, so the MD in Canada. They can answer most of your questions about the interview, how to apply, the difference between observership and elective, um, how to apply for the visa, and also um, some uh, um, uh, different opinions, okay, from different uh, doctors, even program directors. Okay, so let's answer some of your questions. When should we apply for financial guarantee? Like January, February, 2021, is it good? So if you're applying for the, uh, uh, if you're applying for a program that starts in 2021, you should have your financial guarantee in about January, February of 2020, okay? So make sure that you can you make sure that you get your financial guarantee at least two three months before you apply uh, for the, your uh, um, residency. Okay. يا دكتور الله يسعدك منك درست في كندا دحين اشتغلت في السعودية إيش الفرق بين ناحية residency في السعودية وكندا من ناحية العمل والدراسة. Okay. So the, I'm not going to talk about the programs here much. Okay. Because I don't know much about the uh, the programs i worked only at kingsway university and i know our program over here uh i know a lot of doctors who are graduated from the saudi program and they're great okay however the difference in my in my opinion the difference between the saudi and the canadian program is that if you're good and excellent you can, you're gonna succeed in both, either here or there, it does not matter, okay? You're reading the same books, you're reading the same material, uh, you're doing the same surgeries, so you're gonna succeed in both. However, if you're not that good and you got lucky and got accepted in Canada, you're not gonna be able to, to even finish your first year. They're gonna kick you out, okay? Because they're gonna, they usually they evaluate their residents every six months. Okay, so if you're not if you're not good, they're gonna uh, assess you, evaluate you, and they're gonna give you a chance to improve. But if you're still not that good, they're gonna kick you out. So either you get better and 
finish your residency or they kick you out. On the other hand, in the Saudi program, the evaluation, the monthly evaluation is not that good, it's weak, okay? So if you're good, you're still gonna be able to finish your residency and get the Saudi board, okay? So it's not about the residency per se, it's about what's after that. You're good, you're good, no matter what. If you're bad and you completed your, you, you've done your residency over here in Saudi Arabia, then you're gonna be a bad physician and you don't know that, you don't know it. Okay, I think that's the most important thing. And the reason why is because the Canadian programs, they have to follow the Royal College uh, uh, regulations. Uh, if I apply through the Ministry of Education, it will still be a residency, right? I, I did not get that question. The, for, if I apply through the Ministry of Education, it will still be a residency or will I become an academic? No, you still apply for the residency, even if you apply through the Ministry of Education, okay? Your master in US, why residency in Canada? Is it better? So you mean, why did I do my master's in the States? Uh, we had an agreement, I think Saudi University had an agreement with uh, one of the universities uh, in the States. And that's why we applied to the uh, States. And they do have more masters over there than in Canada. Uh, Farah, would my chance of getting accepted be higher when I have just finished my internship? It doesn't matter. However, as I mentioned earlier, it's about your clinical experience. Um, if I have someone who just, just finished sorry, someone who just finished his intern or her internship and someone else who's been working for about two or three years, I would prefer to take that one. Again, it's not a must. I know some applicants who are, um, um, some candidates who just finished their internships and they're great and they got accepted, okay? And others who are, uh, doing their residency here in Saudi Arabia are three or four, but they're not that good. They didn't do well in the interview. Okay, so it's not kind of like a must. Uh, but uh, if you have a, if you have clinical experience and you did well uh, in the interview and your CV is great, then your chances are really high. No, it won't. It won't decrease. Uh, the question is, would my application to Canada be decreased with every added year to my post-graduation? No. In Obigaini, I'm talking about Obigaini, okay? No, it won't. As I said, two of my friends uh, were our fives here when they started their residency over there. It won't. Uh, Zaina, thank you, doctor, for giving this informative lecture. Since Canada is a different culture from Saudi, and to be honest, there is a thing I'm curious about. As a resident, do you get involved in stuff like abortion or surrogacy? Yes, you do, but you have the right to say no. Okay, if you say if you if you don't want to do uh, 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 non-indicated abortions, just say no. And uh, happened to me actually. I was with the program director actually doing a DNC for someone who uh, came to the hospital for uh, an unindicated medical abortion or surgical abortion. So uh, he asked me, are you okay with this? I said, no, I'm not. He said, okay, it's fine. So he did it. And it won't affect the evaluation, not at all. Is the Canadian board in Obigani valid in the States? Yes. Okay. Um, um, well, what do you mean valid? Do you mean that you can work in the States? I think so. Uh, but do you mean uh, valid for you to write the, the American board? Yes, I've done the American board, okay? For you to be able to write the American uh, exam, you have to uh, be graduated from either the uh, US or from Canada. To be able to work in 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 the states, uh, I think so, but I'm not quite sure. What is your advice regarding the electives before and during them? Well, 
the first question is, when do you do your elective? Do you do it during your mid school, your internship, before the interviews? It's a big dilemma, okay? Because if you are a medical student, you can do your uh, uh, actually elective and can be involved in, uh, uh, in clinical practice, which means you're gonna be involved in the OR clinic and all that. But once you're done with your med school, so if you applied during your internship or your uh, uh, residency here in Saudi Arabia, you're not gonna be able to do an elective. You're gonna do an observership. So you're just gonna observe which is harder than uh, uh, an elective, okay? It's a little bit boring and it's harder, okay? However, I believe that it's better to apply uh, about a month before the um, interviews or, or even before your application, before you submit your application, okay? Because they're gonna receive a lot of uh, uh, applications and when they know and they did, oh, I know Ali Basi, he actually did an elective with us or an observership with us. So let's see him. Okay, that is totally different. But if you did your elective, let's say in 2020 and you applied in 2023, then again, I remember you. That's my personal opinion, okay? So I think it's better that you apply for your elective closer to the, um, uh, like an uh, interview uh, months, okay? What to do, just come early, stay the whole day, make sure that you're always um, ready to help, uh, read about stuff, try to answer questions only when they ask you. Um, show interest, okay? Don't come like sleepy and, and you don't wanna talk about stuff or you're in a bad mood, no. It's like you're doing an interview every day. So you have to be ready. It's it's hectic, it's a headache, it's not that easy, but believe me, if it, it will help you a lot. It is worth it, okay? Uh, US or Canada residency, it's, it's better. Well, to be honest, the States, it's not that easy. I was in the States, I did my UCMLEs. It's not that easy to apply to, to the States. Which one is better? I really can't tell. I don't have an experience uh, in the States. Uh, I don't know anyone actually who was able to do his res or her residency in the States, maybe one or two, not much, okay? So it's really uh, not that easy to answer this question. But I think both of them, they're great, the States and Canada. Will the GPA affect my acceptance chances? Again, it is similar to the MCCQE, okay? It will not affect your chances of getting accepted, However, if let's say you have two applicants, I'm not quite sure which one to pick, and they have the same personality, same recommendations, same number of publications, everything is similar between both, uh, both of them. However, this one, her GPA is 4.7, the other one is 3.5. I would pick this one, okay? But if I have someone who has a GPA of 4.7 and she's awful in the interview, she didn't do uh, uh, well, uh, her CV is not that good. Uh, and that 3.5 guy, he's actually amazing. He's active. He worked for two years in, 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 in Saudi. So I might pick this one. Okay, so it's not actually a must, but it will help you. It will help to increase your chances. That's all. Practice in the States. Uh, I I'm not quite sure, to be honest. I don't think you can practice in the States per se. Again, you can write your exam if you are a Canadian graduate, that's for sure. You can write the American exam. I did that. But can you uh, practice in the States? I I'm not quite sure, but I don't, I don't think so. Um, did I answer all the questions? I think so. Thank you so much, Dr. Ali. We've uh, it has been a pleasure having you in Future Pathways. Thank, thank you, everyone, God. for attending. Thank you very much.